Good evening, buenas noches. Thank you for tuning in. Come on in. Good evening, buenas noches. Thank you for tuning in. Come on in. This is a huge event. So we want to make sure everyone makes it in. We're going to wait a few minutes. Come on in. We see you coming. Good evening to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. This is so exciting. Okay, come on in. People from everywhere. We've been getting messages all day from people all over the, the world are going to watch. They may not watch right now, but they're definitely going to be watching. People from everywhere. So good evening, everyone. Yes, you've come to the right place. You're with Books and Books, Miami Book Fair. We're going to get started soon. We just want to give everyone a chance to get in. Come on in. Welcome, welcome. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Buenas noches from Miami, from Miami, Florida. Wow, lots of people here tonight and with good reason, with good reason. We're almost there, but I just want to give just a few more minutes if you can just bear with me so that everyone can come in. Huge event tonight, very exciting. Two of our heroines are gonna talk with us tonight. I can't even contain my own excitement. Wow, I've been waiting for this for a long time. So good evening, everyone. Buenas noches. Thank you for tuning in. Everyone's coming in, we're getting there. We're close, close, close but not quite there yet. Just a few more minutes. Hi, everybody. We're gonna go live soon. Hi, everyone. Good evening, buenas noches. Thank you for tuning in. Hi, everybody. Okay, so I'm going to launch into the intro. I think it's time. Okay, so let's get started. Good evening. Buenas noches. Thank you for tuning in. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan, Miami Book Fair, and all of us at Books and Books in Miami, Florida, I want to welcome you to a glorious virtual evening with Martha Beck in conversation with Elizabeth Gilbert to discuss the way of integrity, finding the path to your true self. Martha Beck is a best-selling author, life coach, and speaker who specializes in helping individuals and groups achieve greater levels of personal and professional success. She's the author of nine nonfiction books and one novel, and has contributed monthly to O oh, the Oprah magazine since its inception. She holds a PhD in sociology from Harvard University. Elizabeth Gilbert is the number one New York Times bestselling author of Big Magic and Eat, Pray, Love, as well as several other internationally bestselling books. She's been a finalist for the National Book Award, the National Book Critics Circle Award, and the Penn Hemingway Award. Her latest novel, City of Girls, was named an instant New York Times bestseller and is a rollicking, sexy tale of the New York City theater world during the 1940s. I want to thank everyone who's with us tonight for supporting your locally owned independent bookstore, Books and Books. It's been rough for us, I'm not going to kid you, so we sincerely appreciate each and every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. But now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Come on in. I hear you, Lizzie. I can hear you. Say it again. Can you hear me now, Martha? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you almost as if we're sitting in the same room, which I wish we were. I wish we were. We are so going to sit in the same room for a while after all this is over. 
It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Everybody, welcome. Christina, thank you. Thank you, Books and Books. For those of you who are not familiar with Books and Books, it's one of America's great independent bookstores. When I lived in Miami, I spent most of my life there. It is a fantastic um, sort of center of intellectual and creative thought, and I'm so happy that they're hosting us tonight. And um, everyone, it's my great pleasure to be interviewing tonight, which is very funny because this is my best friend, you know? <laughs> be, you know no, this interview me. I'm going to formally interview somebody who I love more than I am capable of saying in words. And I'm capable of saying a lot in words, but words will fall short when I tell you how much I love Martha Beck and, and how much I love this book, The Way of Integrity. I have it in the original galley, which I got to read. I've read this book now three times. And the first time I read it, it was read to me in what I will always think of as one of the most beautiful, and tender experiences of my life. In the early days of the pandemic, when we were all terrified and curled up like little frightened chipmunks in the corners of our houses in solitary confinement, Martha would call me every night and she would read from the manuscript of The Way of Integrity while I drew pictures in my journal. And it was so intimate and so extraordinary and so exciting. And what I remember saying to you at that time because Glennon's book, Glennon Doyle's book had just come out, which I also got to re have read to me oh, by the yeah. author. I have a great talent for being read to by fantastic women. Um, and, and, and when Glennon read me her book, I jumped up and down and I said, this is gonna change so many people's lives. And then when I read your book, I said, Glennon's book was the what, yours is the how. That is what the way of integrity is. This book, Untamed, is about needing to be untamed from cultural constrictions and prisons that family and trauma and culture put us into and that we stay into and that we destroy our lives for. And this is the book that will teach you step by step, walk you right out of that prison and into freedom. And that is why it is so incredibly exciting to talk to you, Thank Martin. You. Thank you, Lizzie. Um, I, I wonder if you could explain to us what you mean and what you don't mean by integrity. Okay, so what I do not mean is church lady. <laughs> Looks like you're the little out of integrity. No, no, that's not how they even talk. I was raised Mormon. They talk like this. It looks like you're a little out of integrity. But that is not what I am saying. I am using the term in a purely mechanical sense, and I comp compare it to an airplane. If an airplane is in structural integrity, an airplane has more than four million parts. Four million parts. If they're all working together that plane can take us 500 people, thousands of miles. If it falls out of structural integrity, that means some of its parts are just wonky. It may not take off. You might not be able to steer it. It might crash. And our lives are exactly the same. There are bits and pieces of us and they're meant to be aligned. And if they are aligned, we can practically fly. But virtually none of us get to stay perfectly aligned because we're born with a true nature which immediately runs smack dab into culture, boom. And culture being any pressure from other humans and you know traumatic events as well. So at that point, instead of being one thing, integrity, we leave our nature and go with culture usually. And we are in duplicity, we are two things. And that, the pain of splitting ourselves, I now believe is the one thing that underlies all psychological suffering. And a lot of physical suffering too. Yeah, I mean, I was definitely- One of the clues that you talk about in the book that you're out of integrity is that like mysterious ailments keep mm -hmm. happening. You're in constant pain and you don't know why. I remember when I was 30 years old and about to, well, not about to get divorced because I didn't think I could because I was trying to be in integrity by staying married because I had cultural ideas of integrity, right. um, which said you you had a wedding ceremony um, with somebody you met in a bar and therefore you must be miserable for the rest of your life. <laughs> Wait, wait, didn't I say that's let's go back and rewrite the whole book because that was awesome. <laughs> and I and my body was falling apart and I was 30 years old and I could couldn't walk, couldn't couldn't use my hands, couldn't sleep, couldn't, you know, it was just yep. Um so so I get that 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 is a clue that is often overlooked. Um you you have a guide, you are our guide who guides us through this journey into integrity, but you have a guide of your own that you follow and that you use as, as your sort of North Star. See how I did that? Oh, inside, I see that. Inside Martha Beck joke, a lot of you will catch that. 
and that is Dante. Um, so yeah. tell us about what your relationship is to him, why you chose him to be sort of the patron saint and guide and spirit of this book. I don't know if I even did choose it. A long time ago, you know, I read it, I read the Divine Comedy when I was 18. And I read everything as self-help because I knew. Can we just pause for a second? What were you reading when you were 18, everybody? <laughs> <laughs> that was like, help, the help me. <laughs> Anything. Somebody that was going, okay, oh help me. So I read it as a self-help book. And it is. But nobody reads it that way. I was like, damn, this thing about how you have to go through hell and go deeper and deeper. And then if you keep going all the way through, as Winston Churchill said, when you're going through hell, keep going. And Dante gets to the center of the earth in the awfulest part of hell and is told to keep going. And he doesn't think it's even possible, but he does it. At which point, having passed the center of the earth, down has become up without changing direction. And I remember at 18 going, that's the way. Okay, that's mm -hmm. the way. And when I sat down to write Finding Your Own North Star, my first self-help book, it starts with a quote from Dan, age 35. I woke up in the middle of my life not knowing where I was. It, it, that very first self-help book was also stealing from Dante. He's oh, dead. I can steal anything. Manifest destiny. The, the first line of the Divine Comedy is in the in the middle of my life. I found myself lost in a dark wood. In a dark wood, and yeah. I, I didn't even know how I got there because I'd been sleepwalking away from the true path. So I started my very first book, and the North Star. Did you know every uh, can't, every book of the three books of the Divine Comedy ends with the word stars, and um, so it was kind of I just thought of this yeah. star thing that on, but. Liz, I swear to God, when I set out to write this, I don't remember choosing to write about the Divine Comedy. It just, I just read it and there it was. It was so weird. And the whole time I was thinking, is, is this, can I get away with this? Like, I'm no Dante scholar. And I would read and reread and reread and go, holy crap, he's such a good psychologist. This is actually a path to enlightenment. He, he, he walked it, he wrote it, and he did it in a way that would make it a story and would pull us in. And I, I, I had a lot of weird experiences later on. I thought we would save those for the end. <laughs> <laughs> the closer I got to my own integrity, the more I started like dreaming about Dante and, and I was wondering why did Liz learn Italian really? And I read in Eat, Pray, Love about how he changed Italian language. He invented it. He, did. he invented it. Yes, what modern day Italians speak is really Dantean Italian. Um, yeah, we. It's 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 so remarkable what you're able to do in this book, which is to toggle us between um, this extraordinary ancient classical text that that is really both in its time and timeless, right? Mm -hmm. So he's very much anchored in the thinking of a medieval Florentine oh, yeah. woman. Um, and a lot of his references are really inside references about medieval Florentine life. But then he yeah. has this other aspect, which is just the eternal, you know, um, and, and the eternal, endless, shared, never changing human experience. And, yeah. and you, you move between that and then your own incredibly pragmatic step-by-step -step let me help you get out of hell. Um, yeah. if, if you if you if you might find that you need to be there. And one of the things I found so moving about the book and interesting is that I think when we think about the Divine Comedy, you know, I think we're ge I'm generally aware of it. I must say I don't think I've ever <laughs> read it, um, but I've I've read of it. <laughs> You went out with it several times, I'm sure. Yeah. I've heard people talk about it. I've seen it referenced in movies. I know a guy named Dante. Um, but but there, but we I think we all just through the osmosis of culture know that, you know, there's there's the, the part that's set in hell and there's the part that's set in purgatory and there's the part that's set in heaven. But I didn't realize that your book is divided into four parts because yeah. Something that is, I think, almost the most important part of your book is about the dark wood of error. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you could tell us what the dark wood of error is, because it's 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 such an easy place to get lost and to yeah. stay lost forever before you even go to hell. Oh, before yeah. you're even in a disaster, you tend to spend a lot of years wandering around in the dark wood of error. Yep. You're born, you grow up, you think everything is the way they told you. You're doing everything that you can to be happy, whether you were raised by criminals or raised by priests or what. I don't know why you'd be raised or by criminal priests. priests. Criminal <laughs> priests. Yeah. Oh, we don't want to go into that. Uh -huh. But um, you're doing what you're told will work to make you happy. 
um, you know, even if you're acting out, you're doing it because you're trying to be happy. But at some point you kind of look around and go, this is not working. And I have no idea why. And that's the scary part. And so typically what we do is we try to do things better, do it more. I have a quote in there from one of my coaches named Sonia Alar, which it's advice for men in the bedroom, but it applies across the board. And that is, if what you're doing isn't working, don't do it harder. <laughs> but that, <laughs> that is what people do. We're like, I'm not happy. Like I, I got my undergraduate degree from Harvard. Didn't make me happy. Okay, well, I'll go for my master's. I'm still, I'm less happy. I'll get a PhD. Even less happy. Hmm. Yeah, so we're just, we're wandering around. And uh, Dante talks about being in this fog and trying to get out of it by climbing a golden mountain that everybody seems to be climbing. And we try to climb that mountain and he, he's exhausted and he's depressed and he can't get up the mountain. And a lot of us feel that way. And at that point, the most truthful thing we can do is say, I am lost and I need help and I need guidance. And when we get to that point, that's when the alcoholic stands up in the meeting and says, my name is Martha, I'm an alcoholic. And it's at that point that our teachers begin to show up. And it happens magically for Dante, but it happens magically for everybody. I really believe that. I believe that because I've had it happen to me. me um, you know, it wasn't until I was able to say, um, "I can't be married anymore," that the, that Katutli or the medicine man showed up. Um, but I, but I but I was going to say, um, "Oh gosh, there's so okay." Let me go to my other question. <laughs> I'm like, I've got my any question you want popcorn head because there's so many things. I don't want to get away from the dark wood of error yet or Mount Delectable, which is the mountain that you just or that Dante describes as being this very alluring place where it feels like it, I, I think you could also call it good guess mountain. You yeah. know, good guess mountain is like, if I have enough money, I'll be happy. If I get married, I'll be happy. If I have another kid, I'll be happy. Mm -hmm. If I get a promotion, I'll be happy. If I make love, yeah. happy, I'll be happy. If I do what my parents want me to do, all of that is Mount Delectable. And I was so, um, and it, and it takes you farther and farther away from your nature. Yeah. And I was thinking, um, I wanted to tell you a story that I didn't remember until until I read this, I didn't really see. So my father loves the woods more than anybody I know. He is a woodsman. He is meant to live actually as a hermit in the woods. That is his true, that is his true nature. Um, he knew he loved the woods. That's all he knew when he was 18 years old. So he thought I'll be a forester, that's a job, right? So he thought I'll go to the University of Maine and I'll study forestry. Then he was like, hmm, I heard that that doesn't pay very well. Mm. And um, I need to have money in this culture. So I guess I'll be a paper pulp engineer, um, okay. you know, which means somebody who takes trees that were cut out of the wood and turns them into paper, Yeah, you know, which is quite the opposite of being in the for, wood. For your books to be printed on. Yes, exactly. And then he was like, <laughs> Oh no, there, I found out that there's actually an engine. I hate this job, but there's an engineering job like this that pays more. And that's being oh a chemical God. engineer, a petroleum chemical engineer, making rubber tire engineering chemicals at a factory oh in, in a town on a, a polluted river in Connecticut. That's what I will do for the next 30 years in misery. <sighs> That is what Mount Collectible does, right? And it yeah. took him 30 years to be like, no, I just like trees. Oh. And, he quit and he became a Christmas tree farmer. And then I got my happy father. Oh. But for 30 years, he was in misery. And, and so I, what I want people to get from your book is like, let's try to get out of the dark, the dark wood of error sooner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you, you have a line I love. It's not in the book, but you say it all the time, which is crash early. Cave that, early. Just cave cave. early. Yeah. yeah. Because the characteristic of the dark wood of error is suffering. And there's, there are also six symptoms that I've seen a lot. One is that a sense of purposelessness, then there are bad moods, bad health, uh, failure in relationship, failure in careers, and then addiction. So these are kind of, there are more, but those are the big six that I've seen as a coach. So um, you're going to suffer if you're not on your true path and if you're lost in the dark wood. And suffering becomes your greatest ally because it will continue to increase as you try to climb up Mount Delectable, right? Just like your fathers did, your suffering will increase until you finally are willing to say, this is wrong. I don't, I don't know what's right, but I, I, this is wrong. And then you go into your soul, which is like going into the inferno. You meet your inner demons that are telling you, you have to stay in that in engineering job. And then if you can keep going all the way out the other side, 
Well, that's when you come into your integrity and say, all along, I just wanted to help the trees, you know? <laughs> that was his path and he did it. God bless him, he did he it. He wanted to hang out with the trees. Right? He's just his true friends, his true family. Right. <laughs> um, so tell us about, Tell us about the demons, because I think that's what stops people, is that the demonic voices inside of us that say you absolutely cannot divorce this person that you met in a bar, uh -huh. that you stood when you were 24 years old in front of some people who you barely knew and said, I'll say, you have to, or you are a terrible person. I mean, I feel as though this is where people, it's not... This is where culture has become so internalized. It's metastasized within you into you're the one stopping you. Exactly. At this point. You know, no one out there, maybe out there they're telling you that you can't, but you're actually the one yeah. that's sitting in there. And I how mean, do you do, how do you handle those demonic voices? Well, just think, I mean, everybody out there is probably going, okay, mine says this and this and this. Now, my question to you is, who said that to you first? Who do you remember saying that to you? And are they in the room screaming it right now? Odds are they're not in the room, they're in your head. And this is called an introject psychologically. We introject um, the love of the people around us and unfortunately also their criticisms and their shaming and their, their own misguided things. And what's really crazy is that the more people are suffering from a belief, the more tightly they're gripping it. Because why, why else would you still have hold of something that was causing you so much suffering if you didn't have to You'd, you'd lose your grip on it if you weren't holding really tight. So they'll be like, like I had one woman whose life was ruined by this cult she joined. And she was like, I have to get my children into the cult. Into it, I said, in total horror. And she was like, how else will they grow up? And I'm like, uh, you got a minute? Because I could think of other ways. So we all have these internal critics and I see them as the demons populating um, uh, Dante's Inferno, and he goes and he talks to all these people who are chained, who are undergoing so all this suffering. What a lot of people don't know is most of these people could just walk out. Every now and then a bunch of angels comes down and says, hey, anybody want to leave? Mm. All you have to do is drop the beliefs that are holding you in hell, and we'll take you up to heaven. It's no big deal. And they're like, no, no, I'm going to stick with my cult. You know, <laughs> I'm going to stick with the belief that I have to be like thinner than Twiggy. I'm going to be, I'm going to stick with the belief that I have to stay married, that I have to be an engineer. And the angels are like, all right, well, if you change your mind. Enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy that. Congratulations. <laughs> and so, yeah, there's a whole process where you go and you find your demons one by one and they get bigger and nastier all as you go down in your internal hell. Um, and one by one, you question them and it's the questioning their, their truthfulness that makes them disappear. Because the moment you see they're not real, it's like waking up from a dream. It's like, wow, I was having a really good conversation with Michelle Obama in the hot dog stand, but that was a dream. <laughs> I want to I want to say to anybody who's listening to this and they're like easy to say you should see the horrible situation that I'm in you yeah. should see the dilemma that I'm in you should see the thing I can't get out of you should see the desperate straits I want to let you know don't don't listen to me but listen to Martha because Martha has earned I want to just attest um Martha has earned the right to present these ideas because she has taken, she has put literally her life at risk for her integrity in her life to save it, to yeah. save her life and to save the life of her children. She put the lives of herself and her children at risk. Um, Martha grew up in a really conservative Mormon family. Maybe that's redundant, really. Um, yeah, they were weirdly liberal. <laughs> um, it was Mormon royalty. She was a Mormon. Super Mormon, yeah. She was a super Mormon. And, um, and, and actually I'll let you tell it because it's your story and you've told it before and you've, but I, but I, what I want to get to is there's a place that there's part in the book that I want to read, um, which I think establishes who we're talking about here. Um, it was the moment when you, you go ahead and tell about what you had to do to leave the Mormon church and, and what it cost you, um, okay. which was quite literally 
murder threats and yeah. you know this is no yeah and and a, and a career and your money and your entire family um so yeah yeah um you're, I know. you're not just uh, like talking out of your ass here <laughs> let's just put it that way i mean that too but um i mean it and i i i validate my ass thus um <laughs> Yeah, I was raised in this super Mormon family. I was really, really miserable. And as I was finishing my doctorate, I was still miserable. So I made a New Year's resolution that I would not tell a single lie for a year because they told me the truth will set you free. And I'm like, but how? So I decided, okay, no lies for a whole year. And I didn't tell a lie for a whole year. And I've done many years since then. But this was my first one. And on the inside, I got healthier and happier and more centered and more grounded and more loving than I'd ever been. On the outside, this is what I had to leave or what left me. Uh, my religion, my family of origin, um, my career uh, in academia, didn't like that, my job that I had in academia, my home, uh, every friend I'd made before the age of like 18, my marriage, um, mm -hmm. what am I leaving out? Um, and financial you know, security. But, oh yeah, financial security. No Three money. children, including one child with special needs. With a disability, yeah. And so, um, yeah, that was that was fun. But I also remembered being sexually abused by my father, who was a big cheese in the Mormon church. And when that the word of that leaked out, though I tried not to let it, um, I started getting death threats. I started getting um, really bizarre, like faxes and emails and stuff. And um, 10 years later, I wrote a book about leaving because I was in a place of complete love and I wanted to offer that to people. But then the, the death threats got really credible. And at one point I was, I was paying five lawyers and two detectives and things were not looking good. But I, I had to, or I would have destroyed my soul. Yeah. And you talk about how there was this moment where you were in such fear um, and fear for your life and, 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 and exposing all of this about your family, about your culture, and specifically about this church mm. and about not just your sexual abuse, but the, the endemic sexual abuse yeah. of Mormon girls and women and all of the Mormon girls and women who you had met who had been yeah. sexually abused by elders in the church. I mean, just this, the, like, a, a nightmare, uh, yeah. just a, a long cover up, a long nightmare, and yeah. a lot, a lot of lives being destroyed in the process. Yeah. And um, and and you had this terrible fear that something terrible is going to happen to me. Mm -hmm. And the reason you felt that is because people kept telling you, yeah. "We're going to kill you. We're going to kill your children. We're going to, you know, you've already lost your job. You you no longer belong to this family. Everything, all these yeah. terrible things." But but there was something that you and I have spoken about a lot, which is that when you stand in, I've experienced this in my life too, and it is very strange, but the space of truth is actually a very weirdly relaxing space yes. when you stand in it, even when it's sort of horrible, because as Rhea, my beloved Rhea always said, the truth has legs. And at the end of the day, it's the only thing that stands. And I've had people tell me some truths at times that were that I didn't wanna hear, but even as I was hearing them, there was something in me that relaxed because I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, oh, you don't love me. That's why it feels like yes, this. Yes. Right? Yes. Like, oh, okay, I see. And even though I don't want to hear it, something in me recognizes we're now safe. Yeah. Like, and anything that isn't the truth doesn't feel like safety. So you had that guiding you and you had a, had, had a white light spiritual experience that yeah. was guiding you. But you also did this extraordinary exercise where you took the belief that something terrible is going to happen to me and you turned it around in the Byron Katie style. Yeah. Um, it's exact reverse to test whether it's exact opposite might be true. And I still get chills. It's the third time I've read this book when you tell the story in here about flipping the belief something terrible is going to happen to me and turning it into. I'm going to happen to something terrible. And, and I got that full body chills again by publishing like, that book. Okay, mofos, kill me. I'm going to happen to something terrible, like nothing. My family was trying to put me in prison at the time. It was like insane. And I was like, oh, no. I was free from that moment, that one sentence, because it just went boom, which I call the ring of truth or the chime of truth. And that's how we know we've reached integrity, this. <gasps> and even if it's really scary, as you say, there's a kind of strange, relaxed safety in the truth. And that's what I want everybody out there to feel. I want everyone to feel that oh, all yeah. the time.
yeah. all the time. And you did happen to something terrible. Um, and you got a lot of people out of Mormonism <laughs> and out of, out of bad, horrible, abusive marriages and out of silence about their sexual abuse. Like you happened to something terrible. And, and, and I think that when we stand in our truth, that's what we become. We become something that happens to something yeah. terrible. Absolutely. You know, there's the deepest part of hell in, in Dante's Inferno is where the monster Lucifer is chomping on like Judas and everything. I think it's a metaphor for the deepest crime we commit in our souls. And that is that we come as innocent babies into a really scary world. And there's something called the just world hypothesis where children decide, look, it's too scary if I can't control anything. So I'm going to assume that I'm in control of this mm -hmm. and I'm going to look at the world and my crazy parents and my miserable everybody. And I'm going to blame myself. If I'd been better, if I'd done a better job, if I'd been more loving, if, hand I, over here. if I hadn't been so fussy, if I hadn't blah, 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 blah. And that is, it's completely innocent. Babies do it, but it's deeply wrong. And the moment we blame ourselves for the problems of the world, we are way out of integrity and we just skitter around not knowing where we are. And the moment we look at the world and say, no, I came in innocent and this is messed up and I'm going to happen to this now, me, the way I came in, Hulk, everything can fall apart around you and you feel better than you've ever felt in your life. The shame, that horrible primal shame is gone because it's based on a lie. Speaking of primal shame, oh. um, <laughs> I think our, we do our, so well, you and I. <laughs> um, you and I are both big fans of Dr. Mario Martinez. Oh, um, yes. And his work on tribal shaming. Mm -hmm. um, you taught me something when you and I first became friends you you radicalized my mind. That's <laughs> what I want to say, Marty. You radicalized my mind. I feel like I want to tell everybody how we met and what the impact of that was on cool. me. Um, but Mar Martha and I had met years and years and years ago at, a, at an Oprah Winfrey event. And, um, and it was fantastic. And I loved her. And we hugged each other. And we lit up each other's lives. And then we're like, bye. And we didn't see each other or hear from each other for the, another 10 years. <laughs> um, and then, and then Martha wrote this extraordinary book. I don't know if it, I hope that you will all read it. It's a novel um, called Diana Herself, that is one of the most captivating, amazing, life affirming, and liberating books I have ever read. And it got sent to me in galleys, and I was so overwhelmed with excitement by it. I read it in one night, and I and I didn't want to bother you, so ah! I tracked you down. I tracked you down through mutual editors who we knew, and said. I don't want to be in her way, but like, can I send a, a fan note to Martha Beck? So I sent you this note and I was like, I love you. I love your work. And then you wrote back, I love you. I love your work. Um, and, and then we started corresponding. We made this big plan. We were going to meet in Africa and have oh, a lot of years. And then a couple of weeks later, I, I sent you a message and said, my very best friend in the world. Actually, what I said was the love of my life has just been diagnosed with terminal cancer. And you said to, you told me later that you said to yourself, who is this love of Elizabeth Gilbert's life who is not her husband? <laughs> <laughs> it's because it was odd wording to say the love of my life, my best friend has just been diagnosed with terminal cancer. And you started to counsel me and my, my at that time, best friend, but unbeknownst to me, love of my life. Um, and you radicalized our thinking so much. We had never encountered anything like you. We were in a hell of terror. Um, we were so scared. She had pancreatic and liver cancer. She was going to die. We, I didn't know how to, I, like our whole world was blowing up. And you did an exercise with her. You called, She. we called, you said, I want to give you guys free counseling, whatever we can do to help. Um, yeah. All of a sudden, it became all about helping Raya, yeah. and um, and and you asked her, "What is your biggest fear?" And she said, "I'm about to enter into a world of suffering." And you did the turnaround exercise, and you said, "Sometimes," and I want you all to hear this because it's so beautiful. You said, "The truth of our lives is written in capital letters, huge capital letters, but it's written on the rearview mirror, reversed." So you're hearing the clang of that sound of that truth, but actually turn the words around and it's the truth. It's coming at you reversed. And she said, I'm about to be liberated from a world of suffering. And she just went like this. And you said, how does that feel? And, you sa and she said, that's actually the truth. 
And we didn't know what that meant, but she felt it, you know, I'm about to be liberated from a world of suffering. And she looked at me and she said, Liz, that's true. I don't know how, I don't know how, but it's about to happen. I feel it. And within a week I had left my marriage to come and be with her. We had like declared our love to each other and we just decided to liberate ourselves from culture and to live the last 18 months of her life as in her true nature, as she wanted to. And, and it was extraordinary. But what I wanted to say is after we got off that call, we looked at each other and we said, who the fuck is that? <laughs> just happened like we were both like, and and Raya, we and she said i said you know i feel like i've been living the game of life pretty well but marty's not even in the arena where the game is being played <laughs> the ball completely outside she's doing something else all together and what you told both of us was if you want to be free there's only two things in the world you have to do you have to wave, walk away from culture and you have to walk away from your family trauma yeah. And that's it. Walk away from culture, walk away from your traumatic family. You can have the whole world. And I was like, what? <laughs> Here, because all I've been trying to be is a good girl. Yeah. And, and, and you said, aren't you tired of being good? Don't you want to be free? Mm. So I wonder if you could talk to us. First of all, thank you for changing my life. And thank oh, you. I mean, thank you for thank you for being you. I love you. After we met that first time, I, I flew home thinking. Everybody loves her that much. I will <laughs> never see her again, even because I, even though I love her so much, everyone does leave her for the others. <laughs> <laughs> leave her for the others. Because <laughs> I'm the noble. Everyone noble. wants to come back to be their advisor and their friend. So first of all, thank you. And thank you on behalf of Rhea, because you, 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 you saved us from a terrible fate. You saved me from a terrible fate, Marty, because um, she would have died and I would have sat holding her hand while she died and never having told her that she was the love of my life. And I would have been a husk of a human being after that. And I would have been a very good girl who stayed in her marriage to be good to somebody who she loved dearly and respected dearly, but I would have never spoken who I came to this earth to love. And I would never have been okay after that. Yeah. And so, that is the power of integrity. And you were our guide through that. And you were her guide through her death. And, and I say this because I want people to understand there are a lot of books out there and there are a lot of people out there who will tell you how to live your life and who will make very cheap um, dime store um, affirmations. And this book has such depth. It has the depth of intellect that always comes with Martha Beck, but it also has the depth of honesty of somebody who has walked this walk, even to the, even at the risk of her own life, who has walked other people out of hell and into freedom and who, who is quite sincerely smoking what she's selling. <laughs> <laughs> Smoke it all up. I need to get another supply. <laughs> so buy it and read it and buy it for your friends and liberate yourselves with it. Um, and another question that I wanted to ask you, Marty, is if you could talk about the, the what I would call and what you speak in here about the danger of the word fine. Um, I'm fine. My life is fine. Everything is fine. I don't really have anything to complain about. Everything is fine. Um, yeah, that's one of the how we get into that trap. The two most evil words are fine and nice. Oh, that's not mm -hmm. nice. Say you're fine. Yeah, that means it's because you're you're damping down your suffering. If all you can say is it's fine, here's what I know. You are not smoking what I'm selling. <laughs> <laughs> if you were being true to yourself, if you were walking away from everything that was causing you to suffer, yeah. walking toward everything that was your truth, your truth. Not like manic excitement, not money, not but truth. If you were walking that way, you would never say, I'm fine. You would say, I am freaking great. <laughs> <laughs> like, you basically turn into a Labrador retriever. <laughs> What's happening? Oh, I love that. That's my favorite. Oh, I love you. You're my favorite. No, I see you. You're my favorite. You know, which is pretty much a description of you, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> I was I didn't want to say it, but I'm kind of a golden retriever. I will be a Labrador retriever. We'll just like <laughs> mill around wagging. Yeah. Um, and if you find yourself saying, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, it's generally because you're keeping your suffering to yourself. You think it's not big enough, not bad enough, 
question, not, not big enough or bad enough to change your life. And then sometimes, um, you know, your suffering will amp up. If you're feeling, you know, oh, my marriage is fine. It's okay and everything. And I have this great friend, so that makes it better. And that's really much more fine. And now the friend is separated and now the friend is dying. It's like it gets stronger and stronger and stronger saying, come back from fine and into true. And life will be, I mean, the last third of the Divine Comedy is the Paradiso. And Dante says, you're not going to believe this, but mm -hmm. it's real. And I read it and everybody reads it as a fantasy. I think it's real. So much magic happens when you get into integrity. So fine, nah, go for the gusto. And, and don't be nice about it. I mean, be kind, be loving, be compassionate, but don't be nice. <laughs> nice is annoying. <laughs> nice, is, nice is hard. And it's kind, and, and kind. many of us, especially women, we're taught, we're always taught to, that it's better to be good than to be free. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't, again, we were misinformed by the uninformed. I don't think anybody knew what free meant. Oh, no. Um, Those nice people are being nice out of the goodness of their hearts and saying fine out of the absolute best intentions. You know, this is the thing. Almost everyone in Dante's Inferno is innocent. They don't even know why they're there. And he says, why are you here? They're like, I don't know. I was just trying and I fell down. <laughs> and that's what 99% of the, of the evil we do is all about. We're just wandering around. We trip and we fall down. And the way to get out of it is to say, what hurts? And let me find out where I fell. And let me stand up on my feet in that place and go a different direction this time. And just as you said, um, one of the ways I say what I said to you and Rhea is the opposite. I want everybody to listen to this. The opposite of your worst thought, your most painful thought, is the next step to your enlightenment. So take your very worst thought. Take the absolute opposite of that. And that is the truth trying to blare its way into your life. And it will not stop. I just did it in my head and it felt really good. <laughs> you want to share? Well, you know my deepest fear. You know that at my worst thought is that I'm a bad person. Well, that um, is the funniest. I'm sorry. And, and it's so hilarious. Bad. You know, everybody always laughs, but it's like it keeps me up at night and has done for 50 years. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so the, the opposite thought was like, you're the best person. You're the best person. You're the best. <laughs> and that is the, if you can absolutely get that, to the point where you know the other was a dream and that this is the truth, bang, watch. I mean, you, you wrote big magic because you've had a lot of magic in your life. Try doing this. All I was doing was trying to be honest. I actually was trying to get away from all the new age manifestation stuff. I just wanted to tell the truth. And the, the miracles go absolutely ballistic the more you let go of your lies and, and move into the truth of not just speaking, but acting and interacting and all that stuff. So we don't have a lot of time before we're going to go to audience questions because we want to make sure that 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 we get to hear from you guys too. But I wondered if you could end. I want to tell everybody, this is also, when I say this book is the how, um, I, I mean that it's, it's filled with exercises that really work. And I know because Martha's led me through them over the years. You helped me figure them out. I used to it's like, you. you know, this is like a really pragmatic, none of this, there's not any of this that hasn't been tested on the ground, boots yeah. on the ground. And, um, and one of my favorite exercises is, is the one that, that ends up with now imagine something even better. And I wonder if you could just, I know we don't have time to lead everybody through it, but it's so, it is such a piece of magic when I've seen you do this with people because the most daring thing is to imagine something even better for yourself than the highest you could ever imagine. So I'm wondering if you could talk about how you got that exercise and maybe give us a little taste of it and then as much of it as you wanna give. Um, yeah, I got to the end, you know, as, as Dante is getting closer and closer to the source of the universe, which is he is encountering in paradise. And it's a, it's a, the visual is of a rose opening in light all the time in the, in Asia, it's a lotus, many petaled flower. It's going like all the light of the, of the universe is pouring out of this. And as he gets closer, I just forgot your question. Say it again. Oh, it was the, uh, tell us about the, um, ask, Got it. Even imagine better. something even better. Yeah. All right. So he says, I cannot describe this light to you, but if you can imagine the most beautiful thing you've ever seen in the world, he says, now hold that. Okay. Now imagine something better. 
And he says it three times in Italian, imagini, imagini, imagini. And I listened to it being read like I would go online and listen, even though I don't speak Italian. And he's like, each time it's like, again, better, again, better. And then he says, when you got, when you're imagining be way beyond your ability to even conceive of the beauty of this, hold it steadfast like a rock, never let it go, never let it go, never let it go. And that's how you move into that light and bang, like if you can use your imagination that way, you are using your imagination, I almost guarantee you, to pretend to believe that you're a bad person to pretend that, you know, life is a bitch and then we die. Like, maybe that's true for you. It's not true for me. But we use our imaginations to say how awful things are. That's not what the instrument is for. The instrument is the power of creation in a little lump of gray matter. So imagine the best, then imagine more, then imagine even better for yourself from your point of consciousness and then hold on to it like a rock and you have it is coming. It's coming for you at that point. No stopping it. Nature always trumps culture. Nature won't, nature will not relent. Until it will you not are. relent until you are. You told me something else, Marty. You said um, that the universe wants you to have everything. This, that, and everything. Everything. it's got all these gifts waiting for you, but they, but they can't send it to you until you're at your home address. Right. It's like packages that are being held somewhere and your home address is truth. It's your home too. and integrity and, and truth and integrity and honesty are the way to get there, you know? Yeah. And once you, once you get there and start telling the truth, then all of a sudden, like all the packages start arriving. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Not yeah. like at first there'll be a shakedown because other people won't like it and there'll be and, right. and death threats and your family will never speak to you again and all of that. Yeah. Happens. And then whoosh, it all comes in. Yeah. Um, so Christina, I want to bring it, I want to bring you back because I know you've got questions from the audience and um, whew, Marthy, I love you so much. I Thank love you. you too, Lizzie. Everybody get this book. It's so good. It's so good. And it's you. so, good. and it's a, you know, it's a book that will, that can change your, that can literally change your life. Mm. Yeah. Well, Liz would know Whoa. it changes everybody's life. <laughs> okay, let me see if I can speak after all of this. Oh my God. Okay, so here's a question from Nicola. I understand the idea of wanting to live in integrity and not being in dualistic conflict, but how do you navigate situations where you feel in a true double bind? You can't see options where all your desires, needs are met, or there will be challenges with every choice you make. There will be challenges with every choice you make. And so I always use the scientific method. You have a hypothesis. Well, I think if I try this, I'll feel better. And you do it. And if it's not right, you don't feel better. I think I'll get a Harvard degree. That will make me feel better. Didn't work. Hypothesis tested, failed. Okay, I'm gonna tell the truth for a year. I hope that'll make me feel better. Tested, it was true. Okay, I'm gonna keep going in that direction. So the fact that there is friction Remember, remember, remember that the pain of leaving the cultural system and the attacks that may come are more than made up for by the wholeness you gain from being true to yourself. You know, like it wasn't easy for Liz to leave her marriage and, and be with Rhea, but the wholeness immediately increased. Like, bang, you have so much more inner resiliency to deal with the difficulties of the world when you're in your truth. So just step. Check, just one little step at a time. Step, test, no, go another way. Test, check, only test, check, st test, check in little steps and only do what works and you'll be just fine. I call them one degree turns, take little one degree adjustments. If your life is an airplane and you're flying at 10,000 miles and you turn just one degree to the right toward your truth every half hour, you won't even know the plane is changing directions, but you'll be in a very different place at the end. So keep it really small and test everything. Okay, thank you. Here's a question from Eve. I have never liked my given name. Two years ago, I began using my chosen name, Eve, in safe spaces like a yoga class or Wayfinder training course. After testing it out, I realized how much I love this name. It feels like a remembrance. 
-hmm. However, it has been terrifying to explain to others in less safe spaces like my mom. It feels like a very important part of me coming into my integrity to assume my chosen name. What advice do you bring my duality? What advice do you have to bring my duality into integrity? Well, I once read, uh, I can't remember which poet, but uh, a poet wrote that words are so powerful that if your name were spelled differently by even one letter, it would change the course of your entire life. And I really believe that words carry that kind of energy. And so what I would say, and I want Liz to speak to this too, because she's done a lot of things in a public forum where people are staring at her with expectations and she's claimed her truth. If you can be there with your mom, tell her you're gonna be called Eve from now on and tolerate the, the what I call the transformational tension of her distress and you be the calm one. She may come around, she may not, but you, will come into your truth and life will go much better for you. What would you do, Liz, if you were Eve? I'm just smiling because first of all, Eve, when you you said the questions from Eve, I, I don't like my name. I was like, how could she not like her name? Right. Right. And then I was like, oh, she, it is the best name because she chose it. Um, I'm smiling because my dear friend who you, if you, those of you who read Eat, Pray, Love may remember that I had a friend named Crazy Linda who came to visit me in Italy who was so wild and she was the freest person I've ever met. She changed her name to Shankara. Um, and then she changed, after she trained everybody to call her Shankara, she changed it later to Shankari because she was told that the different syllable would transform her life. Anyway, um, Shankari is her new name. I knew her as Linda for years. So it was hard for me to make the adjustment. And one day I was calling her that and she, with a big smile said, just so you know, I chose my name Shankari because every time anybody speaks that word, which is one of the names of Shiva, it it helps to me to burn through one of my past lives and come closer to freedom. So oh. you just so you know, every time you call me by your, your old my old name, you're trying to keep me in the hell of all my past lives and not help me evolve. So oh. if, you don't like me, if you really love me, call me by my new name. So be of assistance. And I was like, got it. And I never did it again. Wow. Like, but if you want me to suffer in all the hell of my ancient life, just call me by my old name. And um, I, she didn't take it personally either way. She just gave me the option. You can help me evolve or you can hold me back. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should all use that. I literally think Eve should go tell her mother that precise that exact story. thing. And yeah. then you know what? The other thing is you can't make people do stuff that they won't do. Um, so it's oh, just a very point. basic line. And um, and so she might never do it. And can you be okay anyway? Can you still be yeah. Eve even if your mom calls you Linda Sue? Um, yeah. You know, I like to think you can be. I don't think you need your mom. I don't, I mean, it'd be nice if she did it, but but we are not in charge. We do not control people, places, and things outside of ourselves. So as long as you know you're Eve, you're good. Thank you. I <laughs> love that. that. <laughs> I love it. Great, great answer. So here is a question for both of you from Tracy. How did you two meet? And what was that meeting like? Also. What does your support of each other's integrity look like on the ground? How can we learn from your model to have and be more supportive integrity friends? Well, we told how we met. So why don't we jump into how um, how our integrity supports each other? Do you want to go, Marty? I've gotten it. Well, I just have one memory that came up, which is um, after we'd been talking on the phone and you came to see me at my place in California. And I remember you driving a car up with you and Rhea in it and the window was down. And I ran to the car and dove into the car through the window. In your bathroom. <laughs> What? In your bathrobe. Oh, I always was in a bathrobe. Hell, it was out in the forest. Um, <laughs> so I do remember that moment. It's a nice way to meet a friend I recommend. <laughs> she literally did. She jumped through the passenger window right into the car like, oh, God. We were such a wreck that day. We were like, save us. We're in oh, so much trouble. Oh. And you did, and it all worked out. Yeah. It was so good. It wasn't easy, but it was good. What were you going to say? Well, I mean, just I was going to refer to how we, how you, you help me stay in my integrity. Um, and the most recent example of that was um, I was getting a very strong feeling that I needed to get off social media. Oh. Um, and I had all my demon voices inside me telling me you can't. 
you can't. Um, you have worked so hard to build this platform. Everybody needs you. You People expect it of you. You have to be a voice for this. You have to be a voice for that. You have to be a voice for all the things. You'll never sell another book. All the scarcity anxiety. And you, and you coached me through a beautiful session um, where by the end of it, I was like, I'm just going to get off there for a while. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, 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 and it was interesting because, and I love you all, any of you who follow me on social media, my, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that I haven't been there, but, but I had to follow my own integrity that was saying this thing has become an addiction for me. Um, it's become something that's, that's actually not enhancing my life, but swallowing it. And um, I'm ashamed to say how many hours a day I spend on it. Um, this is not, this is not good. Um, and as soon as I got off social media with much terror and shaking hands and thinking I would, I would never, ever, ever, I would no longer be a relevant person. Um, uh, as soon as I, I stepped away from social media within two weeks, I had an idea for a new novel and I've been writing ever since, uh, but you guided me through that. You, 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 you know, sometimes there'll be a call where Marty will like actually do her mostly we're just friends, but every once in a while she'll coach me through my fears and my panics. Um, so yeah. and vice versa. Yeah, Liz is one of those people who is, she talked about working on your integrity like all day, every day. And I mean, she is true blue. And so she has become, I describe it at one point, like there's a, a window pane that's all mucked up by cultural ideas and trauma. And as you clean it, as you get to your truth, the light of the divine shines through. And I've always experienced Liz that way from, uh, I read her books before Eat, Pray, Love. And I was like, holy crap, this is a clear light. And it just keeps getting clearer. And I never come away from a conversation with you without just feeling flooded with light and love and goodness. <laughs> yeah, you should really worry about being a bad person. <laughs> <laughs> History's greatest monster. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> that was on the tip of my tongue. <laughs> yeah, have friends, have friends who have friends who help you to be your who want you to be your bravest and strongest and truest self. Yeah. From Juliana, what are your favorite go-to techniques for encouraging your body and mind to calm down enough to connect with wordlessness, oneness, integrity? particularly when you're around other people and or the external volume is cranked up. Mm, this is very, Liz, Liz has taught me to walk through a crowd without being distracted by the voices on either side. That was a really helpful lesson. Wait, how did I, wait, wait I did? <laughs> yeah, um, we were going through a crowd and, you know, they're all like, Liz Gilbert they, and, and her unknown friend. And, um, you grabbed me by the arm and you said, look really busy, <laughs> really busy and just walk right through. And we just walked right through and it was fabulous. I learned that from Oprah Winfrey. She never walks through a group of people unless she has somebody who she's latched to in an intense conversation with. And it's it. the intense, yeah. conversation. I was like, the intense, intense conversation. We're just going to walk right through here. But what I, um, it's very, what I do is really simple. I do this thing. It's in the book. It's called the surrender allow meditation. Yes. I meant to ask you about that. Good, good, good. Yeah. yeah. Like the first thing I, I, one day I was thinking the first thing I did on this, in this life is breathe in. And the last thing I'll do is breathe out. So in a way, every in breath is like taking up life and every out breath is surrendering it again. So with every breath, I allow things to be as they are just in the moment, not even in a minute now. And then on the out breath, I relax, I surrender all my resistance to things being as they are. And whether I'm in a crowd or in pain or anywhere, that one will put me right in a, in a really sweet spot. Um, I'm going to tell you two of them. One is something that um, a sponsor of mine in a 12-step program taught me, which is let's see how God handles this. Um, there's something that that does to my blood pressure instantly as somebody who her entire life felt like she had to control, manage, manipulate, fix, solve, redeem, tr like trick, seduce, help, you know, like just do everything <laughs> to just say, well, let's see how God handles this. It yeah. just goes like, oh, Jesus, take the wheel. It's kind of a, <laughs> um, and the, and the other one is the, I'm going to put this name right here inside of the chat for everybody. Cause you mentioned breath, Marty. And this year yeah. I started to do breath work. I do breath work every day. Yeah. It's around really awesome. who I love so much. Who's on insight timer, which is an app 
I'm not paying, nobody's paying me to say this. I just found this myself. Um, I looked around to find somebody who'd be a really good breath teacher because I, ha I have a real allergy to yoga voice. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yoga voice, like, hello, drop down. Into, I, I, I hate it because I'm like, <laughs> Come on, you like right. you know, that's not who you really are. I found a real person. His name is Taylor Somerville. Um, I put his name in there. He's from um, grew up in Alabama. He's got a great, real human being voice, and he's a really, really adept breath meditation teacher. And I do about an hour of breath meditation a day these days, and it takes me right into a place where I don't even have to say, let's see how God handles this. Cause I'm just sitting in God's lap by the end of it. Yeah. Inspiration is and, yeah. and respiration to be breathed into by the spirit. Breath work is the most powerful thing there is really, 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 really is. I'm putting his name back in with the right spelling Somerville. You can find him. You're all clever. Taylor Somerville. He's great. Oops, not I spelled it wrong. You'll figure it out. You're clever people. Google it. Um, but he's on Insight Timer and he's terrific. And um, <laughs> so I do a lot of breath work with him. Cool. I love that yoga voice. <laughs> I, hate it. I just hate it. Just be just do the damn splits, ladies. Any of you who are out there who are yoga teachers or meditation teachers, just be just use your real voice because we all know that you're just a person. <laughs> Bend your left arm. So yeah, speaking, so just be, just be. So speaking are. of just being people, let's take one more question from Jennifer. She says, "You are both women who have accomplished great things, and during a book launch like this, it's easy for everything to feel like sunshine and roses." My question is this: What does your everyday life look like lived in integrity down to what you eat every day how you move your body from in balance with health how and where you spend your money what time you go to bed and how much time you spend on social media the real real so to speak yeah and you know what every i'm on the fifth year of my current integrity cleanse which is not cleansing away integrity but cleansing away everything else and it really has gotten down to I read research that says this is the right way to eat. That's the way I eat. I haven't had any refined sugar for five years. Um, you can have it. I'm not saying it's a sin or anything, but I, that chimed for me when I read that it was bad for me. So that, no, no more. <laughs> but I'm not trying to be like, rrr, rrr, rrr. It, feel, it felt good to me to do that. So I wake up, I say, how do I really feel? And once I've established that, if there's anything but peace, I figure out why. Like the other day I woke up, I, oh, I'm kind of tired. Immediately I tell my family in my COVID pod, I'm really tired. I need your help. You got to say it. You got to bring the, the whole group into integrity. And all the way through the day, is, is this exactly, does this feel exactly right? Am I still in peace? Am I still feeling like a Labrador retriever? Yes, 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 yes. Nope. Okay, fix it. And that's after a lot of years. And it may sound like I'm being like super like perfectionistic but i gotta tell you it's so easy to do what feels true it's so calm it's so just it flows like warm honey and there's no effort in it so remember take those little one degree turns but i'm still taking one degree turns i'm just in a really really happy place right now i was smiling at the question because there, i felt like oh you guys I've spent a lot of time with Martha Beck and her family. It is fucking sunshine and roses over there, you know? And it's like, and they have a lot of fun. And it's not about, it's just contented people, you know, who really like each other and are really honest and kind and, um, and aren't on a fixed schedule of, you know, I think, you know, when you were listing all the things, how you spend your money, where you like, I started to start to feel anxious. Um, you know, and I started to feel like, wait, am I supposed to give an answer that says you're supposed to get up at five o'clock every morning and eat a tablespoon of wheat germ and <laughs> meditate for 45 minutes a day? You know, like I'll tell you guys the things I do um, that are good for me. I do because I because I like it. <laughs> I like it. You know, there's things I don't do, but I do that breath work every day because because it makes me feel really good and close to God. You know, um, I. I don't run anymore because it hurts my body. So I don't go for, I used to run, I don't run anymore because my body was like, hey, Liz, we've been around 50 years and this doesn't, this hurts. 
Like, could we do something else? And I'm like, yeah, let's go for really slow walks now um, because I want to keep this body for the next 51 years. You know, um, I like I happen to go to sleep really early because I found out that I like it. I, I am single because I, God, you guys know how much I've experimented <laughs> all different kinds of arrangements of partnerships. But for the last two years, I've been alone and I'm, I, I love it. I love living by myself. It really does. I really do. I don't think that there's anyone who likes their own company more than I do. I can't, if I could think of a better date to go on than me alone in the bathtub, eating <laughs> popcorn and watching the Great British Baking Show, I would do it. But I actually can't think of anything. And if you guys haven't eaten popcorn while you're in the bathtub while watching the Great British Baking Show yet, I am. I you I haven't am. lived. Yeah. Uh, yes. um, and I go to 12 step recovery rooms because I have parts of myself that are addicts um, that need recovery. And I don't go because I have to. I go because I want to, because my life is so bad when I'm in my addiction and my life is so good when I'm not, you know, and I and I delete emails from people who I don't like without responding to them because I learned how to do that when Rhea was sick. Yeah. I did not have time to respond to people's emails who had gotten my email from a friend of a friend of a friend and wanted something from me. And so now I try treat myself every day to going through my inbox and with great joy, deleting emails without <laughs> responding to them. I set a boundary this year when I got off social media, I let everybody who was in them, anything other than my inner, inner, innermost circle, which isn't much more than Martha and a couple other people. You know, I said, I'm working on a book. I'm working on a lot of stuff privately about myself. You will not be hearing from me for a while. And there are people in your life, you guys, who cannot see a closed door without banging on it with their fist. And I have had some very, I want you to know what my real life looks like, is that even in the last two weeks, I've had some very serious conversations with people saying, this is me establishing my boundary once again. Mm -hmm. You, I apparently didn't get it when I said very clearly three months ago that I will not be responding. And the 26 texts that you've sent me since then have to stop. Like, this is me. And I do that now. And I didn't do that for most of my life. I do that not so that I will have... 10 hours a day to write amazing books because I don't write for 10 hours a day. It's so that I will have six hours a day to sit in the bathtub eating popcorn and watching the Great British Baking Show, which is what I really want to do. And Marty taught me that is what you do. <laughs> I don't not respond to people's emails and texts because I'm too busy. I respond to people. I, I delete them because I'm too happy. Yes. I'm too busy doing what I want to do, wasting my time the way I want to waste my time and being and reading the novels that I want to read. And the excuse, the only excuse that this culture will accept for setting boundaries is that you are too busy. And I don't even do that anymore. I just say, I'm taking my time. I need my time. I'm not responding to this. Um, and you've been warned politely. And if you don't get it politely on the first try, I, I will come down on you like a bag of hammers. Um, <laughs> because I love and care about myself too much to have somebody be pounding on a closed door while I'm inside reading a novel happily. You know, I'm getting an amen. Woo! You just gotta leave me alone. <laughs> I love it. My son who has Down syndrome, um, and he says on his birthday, everybody says, are you happy? Are you excited? It's your birthday. And he says, I'm not excited because of my birthday. I'm just happy all the time. And that really is what it's like. I am no more happy today, though I'm ecstatic than I was five weeks ago. Any given day of the last year or so. I mean, it's just a pretty, it's a wonderful world. <laughs> but you don't find that out until you get back into the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so... Anyway, you guys, this is the how. All the questions that you're asking on how to get there, you have to, and there's a, you know, I do have to say there is a part of it that you have to do, and that is to be willing to, a friend of mine recently said, um, I spent my life trying to solve an impossible question, how to take care of myself without upsetting anybody in the wow. process. And only when she gave up on the second part was she able to take care of herself. There's a lot of courage that's required in this, you know? Um, and I often say, like, whenever, like, whenever everybody, and he says, like, it must be easy for Martha Beck to say, I, I could I could tell you a dozen stories of things I have personally watched Martha do um, that required such extraordinary <laughs> courage. Um, and she gets to be Martha Beck because day after day after day, she does the the hard thing, the culturally unacceptable thing, the 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 thing she was trained not to do, the thing that is going to offend somebody, the thing that 
that isn't going to make you be the nice person. She does it again and again and again. And all she gets out of it is the greatest life in the entire world. <laughs> and having watched that close up, I do the same now. And I've lost people and I've disappointed people and people have been hurt. And you know what? I'm going to see how God handles it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, We're all going to survive. And in the meantime, I'll be over here like living this life that I was given stewardship over that, that the universe gave me because it thought I could handle it. And it isn't supposed to just be torment and trauma. It really isn't, you guys. There's something so good waiting for you. So yeah, I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm not just I'm not just a fan of Martha Beck. I bought the company. <laughs> I it was up for a long time. I didn't buy the company. I have no I have no financial association with Martha Beck. None at all. I just love her. And I also wanted to introduce you to this guy. Hi, Boogie. <laughs> this oh. is this has been my friend for the he's my temp cat who's I'm house sitting right now, but <laughs> never lie. That's why I like them more than people. But I'm starting to like people even more. I mean, with a friend like Liz Gilbert, how could you not? And with <laughs> all the friends that have been putting things in the chat this whole time with all these beautiful, wonderful, incredible people spread out all over the world. I am a little overwhelmed. I'm happy as always, but I am kind of overwhelmed by the magnitude of you because it's just imagine, imagine, imagine. It's better than anything I could have possibly imagined. Mwah, mwah, mwah. Happy book publication day, Marty! COVID hugs for everyone! COVID Yay! hugs! We love you all! <laughs> Christina, are you here? <laughs> I'm here! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for all the light that you have projected for all of us tonight. Thank you for being with us in this little virtual, perhaps not perfect bookstore. Uh, I'm glad my sound is not reverbing now. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time, for your work, for your beauty, your presence, your being. You are tremendous heroines for us. You have given us such a special evening. I wanna thank viewers from everywhere for watching. I really hope that next time it's gonna be in person, <laughs> in Miami, maybe. I hope that's coming soon. And on behalf of everyone at Books and Books, Miami Book Fair, thank you again and again for joining us. Thank you for everything you represent. Thank you for illuminating our universe. Thank you so much. And good night to everyone. Yeah. Good night.